Okay, let's start the day. And to begin, I'd like to welcome Dr. David Whirling to the stage and give us an introduction to autism. Dr. Whirling has worked extensively uh, with individuals on the autism spectrum for the past 25 years. In addition to providing diagnostic and learning assessments, he's developed innovative treatment protocols for social competence, self-coping, depression, and anxiety. He advocates for autism employment issues and develops intervention protocols now offered by Spectrum Works Consulting. Dr. Whirling currently supports a number of employees and employment firms navigate the autism in the workplace journey. Dr. Whirling. Uh, lucky me, I get the first spot. Uh, the last time I had to give this talk, it was in the afternoon at 1. So, sorry, uh, Dr. Bailey, that's your turn. Um, apparently, what I'm asked to do is to give you sort of the Autism 101. If you're an advanced crowd, so I think we're gonna go 201. So uh, I have about 50 minutes to deliver that information. There's a lot of information. I'll try and make it somewhat accessible if I can. Uh, I like to roam around, so I can see lots of people are avoiding the front seat. That's probably a good idea, because I do pick on people. Uh, thanks, Angel. So uh, the plan for today, just introduce you generally to the topic of autism. The term terminology has shifted somewhat. Lots of myths and assumptions. We need to talk about the increase in incidence rates. And then, of course, move into employment. And then look at accommodations uh, for retention and engagement. And then move on to sort of any questions at the end. So that's the plan for the next little while. Stay tuned and let's move forward. So uh, for those of you that have been around for a while, autism, the name autism has been around for a long time. But this, the, the terminology has shifted considerably over the last few years. The current terminology is autism spectrum, and it's meant to include uh, all forms of autism, so those that are struggling in the cognitive area, those that are doing well in the cognitive area, what we used to know of Asperger's syndrome is now included in there as well. People often talk about high versus low functioning. As you'll see today, uh, as we talk about it, all levels of functioning are somewhat impacted by autism, and the degree to which they're impacted obviously depends on the individual. And uh, our hope today is to give you a sense of what that might look like in your uh, operations and how that person may fit into your uh, employer employment. The term that's often used is neurotypical, and, uh, and that's meant to refer to someone who does not have autism. So often NT or neurotypicals are meant to include those individuals that don't have a diagnosis of autism or don't self-identify uh, uh, as autism. Generally speaking, more recently, people have just used the term neurodiversity. Let's just be diverse. So there is a huge range of diversity out there. Some of us are great at reading maps. Others are really good with memory. So there's just a huge diversity when it comes to cognitive abilities. So rather than sort of pigeonhole into one specific area, let's just call it a diverse, neurodiverse world and how those people would fit into each one of those uh, employment situations. So today I'll be referring to the term autism spectrum. Uh, and that's meant to include the entire range, both cognitively and other sort of sub, sub areas like Asperger's, etc. There are a lot of myths and assumptions about autism. <clears throat> autism is it's a neurodevelopmental condition. It isn't something that you suddenly develop in your 30s, your 20s, or when you're 10. It is something that generally you are born with, and it moves through your life with you. It's been around for a while. We think of it as a relatively new condition, but it's been around for a very long time. The nomenclature or the name to which we've given it has changed considerably, but essentially it's been around for a lot, very long time. It's also an extremely diverse description. So, for example, if I tell you that I have a niece with autism, it's really hard to tell what I, what I mean by that. Is she graduated from university? Is she able to look after herself? Uh, what's her level of ability in terms of functioning, etc. It's really, it's not a very descriptive term, to be fair, uh, but it is a highly uh, varied continuum with individuals that uh, stereotypically you might see from sort of Sheldon the Big Bang Theory, super smart, capable little professors, uh, down to people that are really struggling in the day to day, uh, having trouble getting dressed, working their way through the day. And more importantly for a lot of us, it's a lifelong condition. So people do talk about ways to accommodate, to support and to work with individuals on the spectrum, but it is certainly a lifelong condition. What it's not when it comes to myths? It's not caused by vaccines. It's not contagious. It isn't just a fad diagnosis. It's not going away. In fact, you'll see shortly it's, it's, uh, it's on the rise. It's not on the decrease. It's not defined as someone who has a special talent or a savant talent. 
but we often think of someone, oh, they've got autism, they must, they must be able to count matchsticks. They must, they must be able to have a great memory. They can do these wonderful uh, cognitive abilities. Some do, for sure. Like, like the rest of us in a neurodiverse world, some of us are really good at some skills and not so good at others. It's the same in autism. And as far as our talk today goes, autism is not confined to childhood. That may sound like an obvious statement to make or an unusual statement to make, but the reality is people in my line of work have forever included autism in the world of childhood diagnoses. Which is great when you have a child who has autism because the resources are there, supports are there, the information, the literature is all there. But for some reason we neglected to consider the fact that most people tend to grow up. Right? And if you're lucky you move into adulthood and so autism is not restricted to childhood. In fact, there are millions and millions and millions of individuals who either have <coughs> autism into adulthood or, or are adults now, have autism and don't know it. So, we're going to focus today on those individuals that are obviously adults and are looking for work. You hear correctly that autism is on the rise. It's absolutely on the rise. So this, uh, this is estimated prevalence data coming out of the Center for Disease Control in the States. Uh, approximately 1 in 59 individuals in, has a diagnosis or is expected to have a diagnosis of autism. 1 in 59. To give you some historical context, 375 years ago when I was in grad school, it was about 1 in 5,000, so it has significantly increased. I have local data, but I just found out from sources just here, hot off the press, this is actually old data. So it, it used to be a year ago, 1 in 57 children in BC currently have a diagnosis of autism. I understand now it's 1 in 51. So 1 in 51 children from the age of 6 to 18 currently have a diagnosis of autism, about 2%. That's a change, and I can't remember the specific number, but roughly 350% since uh, in the, from the last 10 years. So there has been a huge increase. Who do we get to blame? As I said, I can't blame vaccines, we can't blame the water. Who you get to blame are people like myself, those of us that are doing diagnoses. Right? We have included and, and broadened the range with which we diagnose individuals, how we're picking it up, the sensitivity with which we're using those measurements, and the reality is we've now realized there are a huge number of, of individuals that are meeting those what we would consider milder ranges of autism, hence the increase. So it, it is absolutely, if, if you just take a look at most, most employee, most, most workforces, if you do your numbers, 2% or more would be on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. What is the, the ratio among like, all the people, <coughs> say 500 years ago, would you expect the same ratio of So the question is, is it, is it, would the ratio be roughly the same if we looked at this 500 years ago or something to that effect? It's a great question. Uh, the assumption is yes, it should be the same. There was a really interesting study done in the UK a few years back where they just started looking at uh, some random geographical regions in and around London, and they started asking people over 50, just started phoning them randomly and asking them if they, you know, and looking for symptoms and signs. They had these grad students doing that, and anytime they got someone who remotely sounded a little bit like they might be on the spectrum, brought them in for a further study, of them for their study, and by the end of it, what they found is these individuals over 50 who had never been through a diagnostic assessment, the rate was about 1 in 60. So the reality is it's been there before, we just haven't seen it. So there are literally millions of people walking around who would probably make me criteria or criteria for not just an expecting disorder. So a couple things. We know that the, the, the male to female ratio is roughly, it's been, you know, people often say it's 5 to 1, 4 to 1. I'll talk about that in a minute because that's actually changing. It's gone down recently. Incidence rates have gone up. If you look at IQ as one of the factors, something also is different, is changing. So we look at IQ, generally speaking, 100 is considered to be average. If you have an IQ of less than 70, you're sort of uh, in the lower 1% of the population, and that's the marking point when generally it's considered to be intellectual disabilities below 70. In 1998, to give you some example, about 80% of the population of individuals diagnosed with autism had an IQ of 70 or less. The remaining were sort of above that level. Fast forward to 2014, suddenly we only have about 30% of individuals being diagnosed with autism falling in that range. The vast majority are up here. And that's the shift in the demographics that we're seeing is that the vast majority of individuals with autism being diagnosed now 
are in the average to above average IQ range. And that's a shift that uh, is a remarkably different presentation, as you can see, from just 20 years ago. So those individuals that are now out there uh, with uh, those diagnoses have a completely different IQ profile. I'm just going to talk, touch on this briefly. Uh, I don't want to go into all the specifics. But here, here is, the, uh, this is the, sort of the diagnostic manual that we're asked to use when we're diagnosing autism. As you can see, deficits in social communication, social skills or social interaction. Um, the symptoms must be sort of present early. So again, this isn't something you can develop uh, later in life or after a car accident. This is something from birth. And most importantly, those symptoms cause clinically significant impairment. People will often refer, so if, for example, I said, oh, I have a niece with autism. The question you ask yourself is, oh, well, where's her level of functioning? Is she high functioning, low functioning? Whatever that means for you, uh, that's no longer uh, sort of a definition that, that we're using in the literature. And, and the newest, in 2013, the DSM came out with three ways to sort of uh, decide on levels of functioning. Level one, requiring support. Someone who speaks in full sentences, able to engage in communication, but there are some def difficult, definite social difficulties, conversations are challenging, and there might be some unusual presentations. So that's considered uh, autism spectrum level one. Level two, requiring substantial support. Again, some language, but uh, a little more rudimentary, and definitely some unusual communication forms. Down to level three, requiring significant or very uh, substantial support. Uh, may or may not, someone may not be not, uh, unable to speak or not use much language and requiring considerable support. What you'll notice is none of these are requiring no support. So individuals with autism will all require some level of support and I'll get into that more specifically when it comes to workplace uh, and what's required. I talked earlier about gender. The assumption has always been, it's a boy thing, right? If you have autism, it's kind of a guy thing, and all guys have a little bit of smattering of autism. Uh, we'll come back to that later, guys, because that may be true. Uh, when it comes to gender, however, it, so it's five to one, right? So it's always more boys than girls. It really depends on the age at which you take that measurement. So what you'll see is if you're, so it's the number of, uh, the ratio uh, is about five to one if you're looking at sort of kids up to about, 10 years of age. So that's true. What you'll notice as the age along the bottom increases, that ratio decreases. So as people getting older and coming in for assessments, what we're finding, certainly in my practice, and I know Dr. Bailey would, would uh, echo this, is that increasingly more and more women are coming in looking for diagnoses of autism, and more and more women are getting a diagnosis of autism. It's always been assumed it's, it's a male thing. The reality is there a significant number of women out there. So it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio when it, when it comes to sort of people coming in for assessment into the adult range. So again, myths and assumptions, it's not just a guy thing. This is why we're here, so we should get into this section. If you just look at the numbers, it doesn't look like a lot, but this is relatively the percentage of autism that we've been looking for in the workforce in Canada, give or take. You start doing the math, though, worldwide, we're looking at 50 to 60 to 70 million people that uh, would likely, adults, that would likely meet criteria for autism. We know there aren't that many out there with a the diagnosis. So the reality is you have individuals in your workforce now who are probably on the spectrum. They don't know it, you don't know it, they may know it. Uh, the reality is most people over the age of 30 have not been through the diagnostic system that we have now in place. But there are a large number of adults currently walking around that uh, would likely meet criteria. So if we just look at sort of the issues, it was uh, raised in the introduction that individuals on the autism spectrum struggle in the workplace. Let's look at the data. So if we just take a neurotypical population, how many of those individuals are employed? Generally speaking, it's about 83%. So most people uh, without a, a diagnosis of autism uh, who are looking for work are able to work. That's great. If you take uh, in 2015, when they looked at any, anyone with any form of disability, physical disability, uh, cerebral palsy, autism, intellectual disability, for example, what's the participation rate in the labor force? It drops down to about 54%, so considerably less. And then we look at the world of autism and say, okay, how many individuals 
with a diagnosis of autism are working. It's about 34%. A significant decrease in the number of individuals <coughs> with autism who are currently employed. This is just one study. There are a number of studies out there, and they all tend to have comparable data. So it's really anywhere from sort of 20 to 30 to 40% of individuals with autism are employed. The rest are not. It's a huge issue. <clears throat> if you look at people with that other, just the disability category, this one study tracked a series of individuals who went through the United States system of special education and then asked them and then sort of followed them afterwards and said, okay, how many people are working? You've been through special ed, so maybe it's for intellectual disability or maybe speech and language or emotional sort of learning disability. What they found out was, for example, if you had a learning disability, you were 12 times more likely to be employed than someone with autism. If you had an emotional disturbance, you were seven times more likely to be employed than someone with autism. If you had an intellectual disability, an IQ of less than 70, you were four times more likely to be employed than someone with a diagnosis of autism. So traditionally, there has been something about autism that has been challenging in the workforce. I say traditionally because you're here, so I'm, I'm preaching to the converted. Uh, the reality is people are looking for, for differences and, and we now are able to support individuals on the spectrum in the workplace uh, to, in a way that will allow these numbers to change significantly. So I'm hopeful, if I'm still around, give this talk 10 years from now. These are going to be very different, different slides that I'll be showing. So what is it that gets in the way? Why is it that autism is so, so challenging in the workforce? This is a busy slide, and I'm, I'm not going to go in, in, I'm going to cover a bit of it a bit later, so I just want to sort of make uh, a note here. Sort of the internal barriers, we have difficulties often with, and again, these, because it's such a wide range of individuals that meet criteria for autism, some of these apply, some don't, so just uh, give, I don't want to just give a, sort of give a sense of it. So difficulties with emotional regulation, something often with individuals on the spectrum have a hard time with executive functioning, organizing, planning, etc. Some mental health issues which will be covered later today, Dr. Bailey. Sensory sensitivities or sensory reactions or issues, social skills challenges, and possibly some language challenges. So those, that's what the individual with autism may bring to the workplace that makes it a, a bit of a barrier for employment. Likewise, the employers also provide some barriers or have traditionally in the past. Things like just attitudes towards disability in the workplace. Is it an environment that will, is accepting of that? What are the management styles? Is there training involved? Do other individuals in the, uh, in, in the workplace understand autism? Are they supportive of it? Are they sensitive to it? Just what's, what's the structure of the workplace? What are the expectations? Is there any shift or availability or accommodation that can be made? And then as a, and the last point is just accommodation, just the willingness of the employer to make some, what, what uh, I hope to present to you would be some fairly low level accommodations that can really make a huge difference for those individuals on the spectrum. First of all, general assumptions. <coughs> Quality of life for an individual on, this, on that spectrum is exactly the same as for anyone else. Meaning, work is important. It provides a great deal of self-esteem, a great deal of, of uh, focus. It, it makes a huge difference to the individual. It's no different. If you're happy in your job, it correlates to a lot of things in life. Right? And you're happy in your life, you're happy in your job. So it's no different in the world of autism. If you're doing what you do and it works well, exactly. That's okay for me, by the way. I'm happy with that because I'm assuming that she's listening. Right? Probably. Yeah. Thank you. Individuals on the spectrum are quite capable of employment. In fact, are desperate to work and would love to work. So there are some superpowers to autism. Absolutely. Honesty, sometimes to a fault, but it's important, right? So. You know, you ask someone with an autism spectrum, hey, is this, you like this plan? Is this a good idea? You'll probably get a very direct answer, which in the world of business is sometimes appropriate and helpful and refreshing. Uh, integrity, right? Lots of integrity, rule abiding, stick to routine, thinking outside the box, thick skin. These, these are a lot of traits that I'm sure a lot of you wish a lot of your employees had brought to your employment on a regular basis. The reality is these, again, are just some samples, and there's, there's a lot more that we can talk about. This was lifted from uh, uh, a journal looking at um, autism employment in Australia. 
And what they asked the employers was, after you've hired individuals with autism, what difference did it make to your, to your employment facility? So if I were lasering this right here, you would see, probably it'll turn off. Uh, increased awareness regarding people with autism, yeah, about 60% of uh, employers said, yeah, it made a huge difference. People understood autism, they didn't before. Positive adaptation, new creative and style differences brought to the workplace, improvements in the workplace morale, 32% of those uh, reviewed said that was important. I'd like you to draw your eye down to decrease productivity by the team. Zero percent. So not a single employer said having someone on our team with autism made a difference to our bottom line, period. This is from the same publication looking at uh, specifics. Okay, so what they did is they asked, they followed these employees and looked at uh, different traits and looked at what are the percentage that uh, the top percentage that met those, those, those traits. So you can see the, um, the sort of purplish line would be the NTs or neurotypical employees, and the uh, blue line would be individuals with autism who are employed. And essentially these are the differences between the two groups after working there for a few years. So you'll see there's um, more of the uh, neurotypicals who are considered to be flexible in the workplace. Makes sense. Right, so just a little less in the autism world. Attention to detail. In fact, the individuals with autism had more attention to detail than the neurotypical employees. Comparable with completes work on time, following instructions, work ethic, as I said earlier, strong integrity, um, productivity, and quality of work. All extremely comparable. So no difference, really, between those who had autism and those who did not based on a fairly large sample of individuals working in Australia. So I often get asked the question, so what kind of work should someone with autism do? That's kind of like saying, what kind of work should a, a boy do? Right? Or what kind of work should a left-handed person be doing? Right? The reality is, the assumption is, one of the myths is, oh, I understand people with autism should be doing computer programming. Some of them do. Sorry, Carol, I know they do. Uh, but not everyone. In fact, there was a study done looking at uh, individuals in the UK, again, what, where would you like to work? And working in the computing world was about 17% of those individuals. So most like computers, most use a lot of computers. That doesn't mean you should actually work with computers. So you can see it's, it's, it's fairly diverse. So it's having a commercial to business to healthcare, um, the, the, the variety is wide open. So I would really like to, if I can dispel that myth, if you're concerned that you just only have a spot in IT for individuals that are on the spectrum, that's not the case. Again, looking at a separate study in 2014, where were these individuals working? You can see clerical, administrative, laborers, professionals, trades, all over the map. So I know from my own practice, I'm, I work with individuals that are uh, lawyers, physicians, IT, uh, pet groomers, uh, huge range. So the, 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 the assumption is, please do not assume it's only IT. There are those individuals, however, who are excellent IT, and you can ask Carol about that later. The reality is that not all individuals uh, on the spectrum are good programmers. So again, what, why, why work? Why are we even going down this road? And, and as you can see, the reality is these were individuals who had autism or high-functioning autism or Asperger's back in the day. And we're asked, so what, why, why do you want to work? What, what is it that you like about, you, about working? 65% said, well, I just really it makes me feel more important. It makes me feel I can kind of you know, contribute. Uh, I get some independence. I have freedom. It's super important. Only 28% were in it for the money. The rest were all in it for more just let me get out there. Let me be part of that community. I really want to, I want to do things. I want to be part of what's going on. So I talked about those internal versus external challenges. So there can be some internal challenges. Let's be direct. Social difficulties. If you think about it, individuals on the autism spectrum, one of the key components to a diagnostic uh, description is just difficulty with social communication and social interaction. We would expect, therefore, that uh, there would be some difficulties in, in those things uh, into adulthood as well. So I, I said to you before that sometimes being direct is a, uh, is a good skill. Sometimes it isn't. So some, some individual on the spectrum will tell you exactly what they think of what you're wearing, what you're doing, how you, what the work is. And uh, 
And some points, as I said, that's helpful. Other times, a bit not. Difficulties with things like uh, reading between the lines, sarcasm. Right? So, you know, if I, I, I used to do lots of social skills and we would work with kids and, and I'd have parents sitting on the couch, I'd have an adolescent on the couch, and I said, okay, so let's, let's if someone comes up to you at school and says, nice jacket, do they like your jacket or not? Most people I work with on the spectrum might say, yeah, they like the jacket, right? Because they just heard the words. They missed the sarcasm. They missed the rest of the context that goes with it. For those of, those of you that don't have autism, then you're able to sort of, uh, you consider yourself socially strong. Those are skills that you don't even think about. It's like driving here today. You didn't really think about it. You just got here, right? Dealing with someone socially, you're taking in everything from eye contact to facial gestures to, to the whole sarcasm, the tone, the context of the conversation. All of that you're processing at a rapid rate. Easy peasy. Some individuals on the spectrum, that's not so hard. That's not so easy. In fact, it's quite challenging. So yes, you can run into some social difficulties. Um, failure to understand complex uh, instructions or often implied instructions. So I have a, I have worked with an individual who, uh, at the last count, had worked for about 32 jobs, all construction. He'd been fired from them all. Super strong, strapping young man, quite capable, uh, university degree. But he couldn't hold down a construction job. And the number one reason was failure to understand what were seen to be complex instructions. So he'd arrive, at the, he'd arrive at the site, the foreman would say, okay, I want you to take all this crap here, and I want you to get rid of it for me over there, and then he'd walk away. And our guy would look at this stuff, see the guy walking away, and have no idea what's ex exactly expected. Should he use a wheelbarrow? Should he use a broom? How does he do that? What's the best way? Oh, and while he's at it, he's going to start to calculate the most efficient way to get it from there to there. The next thing you know, the foreman comes back an hour later, nothing's moved. They don't tolerate that very well on the first day in some of those jobs, so he would just get rotated through these things. <coughs> Eventually, we did a very low-level intervention and said, hey, why don't you just ask for some direct instruction? Get it written down. It made a huge difference. Uh, sometimes uh, yeah, hygiene can be an issue, sometimes. And that's the same with all individuals, by the way, not just individuals and autism, I'm sure. I'm getting some laughter, so you must have to deal with that. The difference is, presumably, if, you, if, if you're a neurotypical, and you haven't showered for three days, and you show up to your place of employment, someone's going to walk over and sort of start to nudge you a little bit, give you some sort of things like, I'm just going to throw the window open here for a while. <laughs> uh, or, uh, you know, I hear uh, shoppers has got a sale on soap today. Or you know, you'd start throwing out something subtle in the hopes they would pick it up. Rarely would you walk up and say, you know, it smells a bit strong here. I wonder if you've had a shower in the last three days. Would you mind? Right. You're not going to do that. So the problem is, in the world of autism, there are, whether you, you know it or not, you work all around the edges of subtlety. Most of what we do is, is subtle and it's inferential. So you'll make little comments here, you'll do this, you'll raise an eyebrow, you'll titch, you'll do something. You make something that the other person will say, oh, I get it, I need to do this. Often, unfortunately, some individuals on the autism spectrum are missing those cues. And if you miss those cues, you really lose a chance for sort of social correction or social change. So uh, that can be a problem. Job interviews. How many people here uh, for a living do job interviews? Okay, a few of you, excellent. Um, so you know what it's like. Your job is to, is to find the best candidate. So you're gonna screen all these people on these sheets of paper, whatever you do, they come in, and then you're gonna make your decision. And presumably you're gonna make your decision as a very social creature, and you're gonna try and hire the other person as a social creature. So you have rules in your head or guidelines that you're going to follow to hire that person, whether you have them articulated or not, they're just there. So you want to make sure the individual is going to fit into your environment. The problem often in the world of autism is the number one block. First of all, if they can get themselves organized to get the paperwork in, get the, the resume together, get the cover letter in, and get to the appointment, they sit down in your office and they do the interview. And this is where I often see uh, or hear from a lot of individuals where they really struggle. So the number one thing is we expect eye contact. Right? You spend 45 minutes with somebody interviewing and they don't look you in the eye. Your first, if I asked you, how do you feel? You might say, hmm, not sure. Right? 
people use the word, I'm suspicious. Uh, that person was really low, uh, you know, low self-esteem. They weren't very confident. Not who I wanted my, my organization. <clears throat> By the way, a lack of eye contact is just one symptom of autism. It isn't the symptom of autism. There is no such thing as a single number one symptom of autism. So you will find individuals with autism who have fantastic eye contact. Some with overly intense eye contact that's straight there that you can't move. And some with very, very little eye contact at all. So in the job interview, it's, it's challenging. And, and I, I apologize to the, those of you who have heard this story before. This is the part where I swear. Um, I, had a, <clears throat> I have a client who's uh, now in his early 30s <clears throat> who uh, told me an interview story that he did. He, he has been working and has been working as a server in restaurants for years. Uh, he isn't sort of what you would imagine as a stereotypical autism, uh, individual with autism. He's really super like GQ good looking guy. He pays full attention to, he you know, proudly used the term metrosexual before I even knew what it was. Uh, you know, he, he, fortunately for him, he comes from, from some financial support. So he dresses beautifully, he's a good looking guy, he's actually quite social, uh, but at 30 he has zero friendships. Hasn't had a friend ever, actually, and prefers his own company to those of others. But he likes to work, and he wants to work. So he went off to a job interview in another city, uh, and he was j being interviewed uh, at a place doesn't matter what it was, he was in a restaurant, fairly high-end, busy, sort of um, uh, highly um, kind of soapy kind of place. <coughs> so we went in for the interview, and, and uh, the woman who was, work, who was doing the interview liked what she saw, clearly she said, oh, come on in, have a seat, let's, let's talk. So they're in the restaurant, and they're having this conversation. And she starts with the usual questions, oh, I see you've worked at so-and-so, what was that experience like? And oh, I see you went to school here, tell me about that. Oh, and, and why do you want to work as a server? And so she, she did all the standard questions that many of you would ask. And then she dropped it. She said, so, if you were going to be a kind of sandwich ingredient, what ingredient would you be? So my guy says, pardon? She says, you know, if you're going to be like a sandwich ingredient, what, what, what would you be? And he says, what kind of question is that? <laughs> he stands up and he storms out. I saw him two days later and he said, what kind of question is that? And I'm still struggling. Maybe you guys can help me in the, in the HR department. Right? <laughs> so we went over it. Like maybe, maybe, you know, she wanted you to be like lettuce, kind of bland, not really sort of stand out. Or maybe you want a jalapeno and be spicy. Or maybe you're like the, the bread, like, you know, the solid foundation. I don't know. He, he had no idea what it meant. To this day, he doesn't know what it meant, and he lost the job. Now, most of you're all thinking, I think I would be watercress, or I mean, you, know, <laughs> you guys can do your own projective, and we can talk later. <laughs> the point is, he lost the job. He would have been excellent in the job. He had everything they needed, but he couldn't answer the sandwich question. So we talked about it, and, and to this day, like I said, he's still frustrated. Most of us probably would have sat through this saying, that's a really weird question. Okay, and then he would just kind of make something up on the spot. For, for him, he just wasn't capable of doing that. So the job interview is one of those things, and uh, I'm not sure if we'll talk, be talking about it specifically today, uh, but it's one of those things that can shift and change. And with those shifts and change, you can introduce a whole uh, realm of individuals that would have tradition, st struggled in that traditional job interview. <clears throat> Executive function can be challenging, for sure. Uh, as you'll hear a bit later, there's some co often some coexisting um, mental health condition, anxiety, depression, things like that. And then some sensory, sensory issues as well. I worked with a, uh, with a woman who was uh, fantastic at her job. In fact, she was so good at her job that she has uh, been asked to be promoted three times. Turned them all down. In fact, too many times and the union came in and said, you can't turn down four promotions. And there was a huge issue, and we figured it out. She turned the job down, the promotion down, because she was really good at what she did. And what she did was just working on the phone with, with uh, customers, customer service. She loved it. They wanted to promote her to management, which meant she was going to be working less with customers and more with the, the team members. And she didn't want to do that. 
the other issue for her was that she was, uh, she was arguing with the union because she wanted a separate lunch area. That's all she was asking for. Can I just not eat in the same area as everyone else? Because she had a number of sensory issues that were so strong, she couldn't be in when people were popping up in their tuna salad or they're eating their, their, their eggplant or what they were doing. It just doesn't work. So for some individuals, that sensitivity is, is it's visceral, it's real. I mean, we all have things that we don't like, so nails down a chalkboard. For me, it's balloons. So if you take a balloon and you, you rub a balloon, just gets me, right? Yeah, a few people here. Um, I was working with a woman who uh, was in university, super bright. She's sitting in, she's sitting in lecture, and uh, the woman behind her starts to eat a banana. Right? Okay, it's a little weird eating a banana in a lecture, but she was doing it. And so my client was getting increasingly agitated by the sound of this woman eating a banana. If you think about it, it's got kind of a bit of a mushy sound to it, right? So she's, she's trying hard to focus on lecture, and she kept, so finally she just stood up, turned around, and she just let this woman have it in the middle of lecture. <laughs> so whatever you think you deal with on a sensory issue, what smells you don't like, or tastes, or certain cloth or textures you don't like, you can sometimes magnify that significantly for some individuals on the spectrum. So again, you can make shifts and changes to the environment. Pretty straightforward. So what about the employers? Well, it's all in the attitude we hear. So uh, in one study they looked at what was so, so one of the significant barriers, and that was the employer. So just not really understanding the issues that are involved in autism. So as I said, if you, if you meet a coworker and that coworker avoids your eye contact, uh, says things in a very blunt kind of way, that's someone you may start to, if you didn't know the context, you didn't understand, the rationale behind it, you might start to move away from or avoid and or that person may not be in line for promotion because of that. But in, within the context, that suddenly changes when it comes to autism. Workplace adjustments, accommodations. Right? Often uh, individuals I work with on, on the autism spectrum are really looking for what I would consider to be really low level accommodations. You know, it's a change in, in, in a seating arrangement, maybe a change in the lighting, uh, just a, a change in some of the sensory issues, uh, someone to, to, to relate to in a different way. Not, we're, not, we're not looking at significant changes, structural or uh, uh, any other way. This is actually two bullet points, not one. Reluctance involved with third party support. So things like job coaches you'll hear today are, are uh, getting other supporters, getting uh, people to come in and support your uh, uh, employment uh, setting. Really, again, a fairly low level thing to do, and as I'll show you shortly, makes a huge difference to the likelihood of, of retention in particular. And then there's all those rules, right? Those, those rules in your, your place of employment. I don't mean the ones that are on paper. I mean the ones that aren't said. Right? So I had one, one poor guy who was <coughs> getting a lot of pushback from the place he worked because he was working way too hard. He didn't quite realize that everyone kind of finishes at four, and that's when you stop. Everyone takes their break. He wanted to work through his lunch. He didn't really want to sit and talk to people. He just wanted to work, right? But he was working way too hard. He was making the other people look up a little bit uh, less productive. So he was getting a lot of pushback from his peers. Um, the, the, uh, the other uh, reality is, and I just say this because this was a, an important thing one of the clients I worked for, and it comes back to honesty. So I had a... a uh, a young man who's now probably, I guess he's about 35. He was working in a factory, forklift driver. He was, by the definition of their, his employer, the best forklift driver they've ever had. He's the only guy who came in and actually followed the safety rules. He's the only guy that actually read the safety rules. And he's the only guy that did those repeatedly every single day. Never missed a day, followed every single rule, worked through his lunch, and that was an agreement because he could leave early because he wanted to go home and do his stuff. He was into to, to plants and, and, and science and nature and he wanted to just go back and research. He didn't want to do his, what he was doing. So, great, no problem. He gets sick, gets a cold, calls in as he's supposed to. Protocol says, if you're sick, you call into your work and tell them that you're not going to be there. No problem, he did that. But it was a nasty cold, lasted about six days. What he failed to do was then call back the second day because that's what you're supposed to do. In his mind, that's stupid. I, I told you I was sick. Why would I need to call in again? This happened repeatedly. He was called in, went off to occupational health and safety. They started asking questions. So, you know, how are you? And, oh, uh, do, do you drink alcohol? Yes. Tick. 
Remember honesty and integrity? Have you ever had more than two drinks in one evening? Tick. I know what you're thinking. And have you ever had three drinks in one evening? Yes. Have you ever lost memory because of drinking? The word is ever. Not while you're in employment, ever. So he says to himself, yeah, when I was like 16 or 17, I, you know, I'm, yeah. So he takes yes. Suddenly you've moved into the drug alcohol problem, addiction. Uh, and he had to go through a whole series of, of things. He doesn't drink, by the way. He doesn't drink anymore, but he did. And so he, he answered the question honestly. So sometimes the rules we put in place, we know they're just sort of guidelines, but in, for some individuals that can be significantly apparent. I'm going through till uh, 12.30 today, right? No. What time am I going through? 12. 10? 11? 10. 10-ish. Ten okay. All right. Uh, Supports. So what, what would it take? So far, hopefully I've outlined for you that we're looking at a, a wide range of individuals. Individuals that have traditionally been either underemployed or unemployed. And by underemployed, I mean I work with a number of individuals who have advanced degrees that are doing jobs that clearly are not uh, related to it. So I have you know, individuals that advanced degrees in statistics, engineering, law, medicine that aren't working in their field. Uh, so, and I've now hopefully given you some indication of what some of those barriers traditionally have been. Now let's talk about what we can do about it. So this graph followed individuals with autism in the workplace for a year and a half. And then looked at the level of support that they required to stay in the job. So how much work was required to keep them working for a year and a half. Minimum, minimum intervention was defined as four hours or less per month. Not per week, not per day, per month. Intense was more closer to sort of 10 hours per month or more. So what they found is after 18 months, again if I had my pointer, you would see that there were, right off the bat, only about 60% of those individuals required a little bit of help. By the end of that term, most of those individuals, most of all, of the whole entire set, and there's 104 adults with autism, by the end of that 18 months, all 100, most 104 required less than four hours of support per month. So it isn't a huge ask, and that level of support can, as you, as you can see, hugely varies. So, and uh, Dr. Bailey will talk more about this when it comes to mental health piece, is that really when we look at, I hate the fact this one arrow just floats up there. It's one of those PowerPoint <laughs> errors, you know, and you just go, oh, really? Should have fixed it last night, but I got my slides in really early, like on Sunday night at 11. <laughs> so some of those interventions are really basic. So let's just say you're, and this, by the way, can apply to, for most individuals in your workplace. So you have some kind of behavior, someone who's breaking down, who's upset, who leaves early, who, who has a bit of a tantrum on the job. Okay, so what are we looking at? If the individual has autism, the first thing we need to look for, okay, are their autism needs being met? So for example, is it a sensory issue? Is it maybe the fact that they're um, um, you know, requiring different lighting or there's some, some reaction that's basically specific to autism? If they're not being met, obviously, you fix it. If the behavior stops, we're done. Right? That's, the, that's the simplest, lowest level thing. So what is it we need to shift? Is it specific to autism? OK, let's go in and fix it. Done. If you go in and you look in the, well, actually, we've looked at the lighting. We've talked to sensory issues. Everything seems to be OK. We can't, you can't track it down. Then the next thing you want to go to is, OK, let's look at mental health. What are some other things out there? And again, that will be covered by Dr. Bailey today this afternoon. Anxiety, depression, uh, other kinds of things. We address those. The behavior stops. Great, we're done. It isn't always this clean, by the way. I wish life was exactly like this. It doesn't work. So you can, you can place yourself into this uh, frame anywhere you like, your family members or your employees. Uh, if it doesn't stop, you go back. And you're just going to start to circle that loop back and forth until we find it, but the reality is you'll find it. It's out there, right? And it just takes, you, in, like everything else, 
with a specialized population, you just have to, ask, have to ask the right questions. So if you're not asking the right questions, you're not going to find it. But once you have, it makes this uh, system much uh, easier for the employee and the employer. So what are some specific combinations we might want to make? Direct, clear feedback. Remember my shower comment before, right? So instead of just throwing the window open and making a comment, hoping it's going to work, I, I, I can't count the number of times I've had people sit on my couch. Yes, I have a couch because that's supposed to be by stereotype, aren't I? Right? No, no patches on the elbow yet, though. <laughs> so sit on my couch and say, I wish, I wish, I wish the world would just be straightforward and direct. Why is there all this fluff? Why, 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 what's, what's all this about, right? Why can't I just say, you're an idiot, or I don't like this, or please don't do this, right? Imagine, I, I'd love to see that a day if we could just like, you know, there's all these movies like The Purge, you get 24 hours to do this stuff. What if there was 24 hours in a day where we could all be direct? That'd be kind of fun, right? Um, so, and, and, and we're, we, we try to be subtle because we're, we're trying not to hurt feelings, right? We don't want to be nice. You don't want to say, look, you know what? Yeah, could you just please maybe have a shower today? You, oh, and you're afraid of being embarrassing. But in the world of autism, often what they're missing is direct feedback. And that direct feedback is really helpful, right? So if you, you know, walk up and say, hey, just got to let you know. Uh, looks, you know, feels like you haven't had a shower in a couple of days. Would you mind doing that for tomorrow? Thanks. Done. Right? Or, uh, and so the direct feedback is really important. Attention to sensory issues. You know, getting that separate lunchroom from that one that I talked about or different kinds of lighting. Things that are generally fairly specific to, to, to most of us aren't noticeable. Again, it's the balloon thing. So when I did that with the balloon thing, about a third of you went, Ugh, and the other third went like, what's he talking about? Balloons are fine, right? So if you're a non-balloon person, you wouldn't think of that accommodation. Job coaching. So there's an entire industry out there of individuals who make a living and are trained in the world of autism and helping individuals work on the job. Occupational fit. So it is the job that you're asking this individual to fill, is it really what they're good at? Is it really what they're capable of doing? Is there a way to shift that in a way that would allow that individual into your organization in a way that would be more productive for them and for you? So maybe there's a shift there. Supporting mental health. The, the assumption is often that individuals on the spectrum would require just the same sort of extended health package as other people, maybe. But you might, might, might want to make that a specific uh, to autism kind of package, or you might want to do something different. Uh, all right, well, I appreciate uh, your attention this morning, and I'll be around for the day if you guys have any other further questions.